Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Cluck. I'm here with Jennifer Day and uh, four other speakers who we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, this is a uh, NOAA and Army Corps and <laughs> Michigan State Climatologist uh, uh, briefing for you on uh, Great Lakes water levels. And we'll get into this in just about two minutes. I'm going to let folks. Uh, let a few more folks get in before we get started. So stand by. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Again, this is uh, Doug Clark from NOAA. Uh, we're going to uh, have four speakers today. Uh, we'll go through, as we uh, as they come up, we'll go through them and uh, uh, introduce them. Uh, your first speaker is Jeff Andreessen. He's a state climatologist for Michigan. He'll be giving us a weather and climate update. Before he starts, uh, just to let you know, uh, just to offer the uh, the question uh, tab in your interface there allows you to put in questions as we go, so you don't have to remember them at the until the end. Uh, so feel free to write your questions in that and send them to us, and we'll we'll start getting those answered. There will be a Q and A session at the end, uh, mostly for typed in questions and that kind of thing. So uh, I guess on that note, we're ready to get going. And so, Jeff, why don't you take it away? Well, many thanks, Doug, and good afternoon. As uh, Doug mentioned, I'd like to start off or lead us off here this afternoon uh, talking a little bit about where we've been, and then uh, we'll transition and, and then have a quick look ahead. Uh, and a lot of what uh, I'll talk about, it goes back to really our last uh, briefing here, back to last fall, but uh, a lot of it will focus on uh, the recent past as well. I want to start off with uh, probably, I think, one of the most significant pieces here as we look at the last several months. And this is a graphic depicting total precipitation since the beginning of November, the hydrological year up through the end of, of April. And on the left hand side, you can see the actual totals. Uh, and the advantage of this, this is actually using a, a data set from uh, Canada. It's the Kappa database. It's a 10 kilometer combined uh, source. Uh, it uses uh, actual ground observations. It uses some radar and then it uses some model reanalysis. But the important thing is it gives us a, an, a glimpse of precipitation over the entire basin. And it's one of the relatively few resources we have like this. So I want to take advantage of it. But again, on the left hand side are the actual amounts. And you can see that since November, well, if you do the quick uh, conversion in your head, it's in it's in metric, but uh, somewhere between 12 inches total of, uh, and this is water equivalent, so it's both liquid and all melted frozen precipitation during that time. Uh, the lowest amounts fell in the far northwestern part of the basin. That's outlined here in black, a thick black line. And then on the right-hand side, which is a little bit more interesting, is that total relative to a longer term nor normal. And I would mention here too, this is not a standard 30 year normal. It's uh, they're not quite as many years of, of data, but it's about 20 years. And what you can see for the vast majority of the basin, uh, lots of browns. So generally, uh, most areas here between 50 and uh, maybe 80 percent of normal. Uh, some areas, again, up in the northwestern corner of the basin, actually were very close to maybe just a little bit above. But the uh, area-wise, and looking at this uh, overwhelmingly, uh, it was a drier than normal uh, at least six-month period for the Great Lakes Basin. We'll hear more about that in just a second. 
looking at uh, more specifically here the last three months, the last 90 days or so, uh, the totals here on the left, for, this is the departure in inches here, and we're looking here again on the, this time, on the US side, and I've got one more figure up on the top here, which does include Canadian data, and that's the accumulated precipitation for the same period, again, early February through early May, uh, relative to normal as a, expressed as a percent of normal. And you can see some similarities to the graphic you just saw, but uh, a couple of important things. If we look at precipitation in the most recent past couple months, very, very distinct areas here, ranging from uh, much above normal, look to our south here across the Ohio Valley and into the middle Mississippi Valley. And you see areas here that are far above uh, average uh, precipitation, but once you approach the southern, really the southern boundary of the basin, it really, really drops off dramatically. And so you've got a huge range of, uh, of precipitation totals here recently from some cases more than 10 inches to less than four or even three inches uh, as you approach uh, the central lower peninsula of Michigan. There's also another area up in the far northwestern corner of the basin that has also done better uh, or had relatively more precipitation than others. So it, it, a lot of it is location here. It depends a lot on where you, what you, where you are. And I would also mention here again, we're, we don't see the, any uh, Ontario or any Canadian data here, but looking at the upper right-hand side here, you can see that eastern portions of the basin the, near the lower lakes are similar to what we've experienced uh, in the south and, and central portions where we've been drier than normal. Uh, Want to have a couple graphics here to depict that over time. This is a, a running uh, total of precipitation versus normal. The actual observations are in here depicted in the green line. The brown line is the normal. This is for uh, Muskegon uh, in west central lower Michigan. And this is a, a, in an area that's typical of that drier area that we've had. Uh, and I'll start there, but you can see as the uh, precipitation accumulates, really drops off here late February. March was uh, significantly drier than normal. We did have some significant precip uh, in the first week of April, but since then it has also uh, dried out as well. And uh, we're left here in, in this particular instance with a deficit over the last, again, uh, three to four months on the order of uh, almost five inches, which is pretty significant. Winter, cold season is climatologically the driest time of the year annually uh, for almost all of our region, but still, uh, if when we have these deficits over such a long period of time, they can build up. Now, uh, one, I guess, additional point here, if we would have looked up at the northwestern portion of the basin, uh, we would have a, a running total that was much closer to the normal. But again, most of the basin looks something like this with, with running deficits over the last couple months. In terms of temperature, uh, we have seen from the, this is back to the beginning of October, uh, this was a warmer than normal period if you look at the overall average. This is again October through here uh, last week. And the departure is actually fairly significant for such a long period here. Uh, you can see most areas here too is to as much as three degrees Fahrenheit above normal. And again, for a long period like that, that's fairly significant. So it's also been milder than normal, at least on average. And for our, our winter period itself, which is uh, December through February, if we use that that definition here, it was a milder and drier than normal winter over virtually all of uh, all of the region. Again, the uh, you can see the positive temperature departures here on the left, and then the warmer colors here indicate precipitation deficits on the right. So uh, again, most areas uh, were in that category. I think maybe the most important thing here that I wanted to bring up was if you look at accumulated snowfall, and this is a complete total seasonal snowfall from, uh, well, last year, last fall, up through present, you can see that almost all of the basin had well below normal snowfall. It was especially significant, those departures, in areas which typically get lake effect. Uh, the, the amount of lake effect snowfall this past winter was much below normal. There is one exception here uh, to, to note, and that is you should go south into, uh, again, the, the Ohio Valley and the middle Mississippi Valley. We had several large synoptic systems that brought uh, a great deal of frozen precipitation. So as you move south out of the basin, uh, there was an area just to our south again where snowfall totals were, were actually above or even significantly above normal. So it, again, depending on where you were, but most of the Great Lakes Basin itself was below normal in terms of snowfall. Uh, in terms of temperature, I mentioned that it was milder than normal here for the last uh, several months on average, but there were notable differences. We had some relatively cool weather 
back here uh, in the early and middle part of the fall. Uh, and with this particular graphic, these are daily maximum temperatures. Those are depicted by the blue bars here, the max on the top, the min on the bottom. And then the colors here depict long-term climate. And for the majority of days here, we should be somewhere in this brown range in the middle with our normals. The uh, reds here depict the all-time or the record maximum temperatures for the date, and then the blue, the minima. So again, we should be revolve or sort of evolving, running along this uh, long-term mean. And you can see that generally is the case. There are a couple of exceptions, though, to point out. One is uh, this area of warmer than normal weather that we had back for much of the month of March. You can see even some record-setting daily temperatures uh, at that point in time. This is, once again, Muskegon, but it's fairly representative. And uh, the other thing to note here at the end of the series is it has, it has gotten significantly cooler. We've had uh, here uh, at least two weeks of cooler than normal weather. We also had some of that back in the middle of April, big upper air change that took place. And then one last thing I just wanted to make note of, this big departure here in the middle of February, of course, was our Arctic outbreak that uh, everybody probably can remember. Uh, some probably not fondly, but uh, this was, was definitely by far the coldest outbreak of uh, the winter, lasting a couple of weeks uh, in most cases. I want to just say a couple words about that, is, uh, about that because it is uh, fairly interesting. The Arctic outbreak followed uh, a stratospheric warming event, and I won't go into detail about that, but it's a, a phenomenon actually in the second layer up above the, uh, the troposphere where most of our weather takes place. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes that, that warming event has an influence and an impact on the jet stream flow in the troposphere, which, of course, the jet stream is what does control our, our uh, weather on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis. And essentially what we got here, this is looking at an upper air map in the middle of February. Uh, what we got was a piece of the Arctic that, uh, that moved and was pushed farther, much farther south than it typically is. And you can see that here, uh, circled here in the blue feature. So again, literally, this is a piece of what typically is is experienced up on the high latitudes, but it was displaced southward. And that was the physical source of all that cold air that we experienced uh, during mid-February. Quite unusual, but it happened sometimes. And But that was the, what we saw in February. The uh, and, and probably as most people appreciate, the Great Lakes uh, at that point in time actually had very little ice on them because of the mild temperatures, but uh, the lakes themselves did end up having a major influence on air temperature. You can see uh, an image of that from satellite looking at the auto convection of clouds forming over mostly uh, ice-free Lake Michigan in early February, and then some air temperatures here on the right-hand side by color, and you can see the shadowing influence of, of the Great Lakes themselves with uh, major moderation in the air as it flows across the lake. So. Well, and, and I'll show you an image of this in just a second, but it had a major influence on our minimum temperatures. It also led to a period of, of very heavy snowfall, uh, which is what you see here. These are the totals on the far left, and that's, that's where a lot of that snowfall fell in the areas to just to our south. Uh, increased the depths dramatically here, that's in the middle here, and then uh, the accumulated snowfall as a percent of mean. You can see some of these spots again south, uh, more than 300% of normal snowfall for the uh, for that period including or 30 day period including that cold spot well in terms of impact and looking at extreme minimum temperatures we, we had some very very cold temperatures in portions of the region but as i mentioned the lakes moderated those on the right hand side here you can see michigan and portions of wisconsin with uh, about 400 sites in here looking at min temperatures and again just to not to belabor the point, but it is just incredible how much the lakes do modify uh, temperature. You can see the minimum, these are the all the all winter minimum temperatures, extreme low temperatures, uh, ranging from uh, single digits just below zero uh, to more than 20 below zero on the upwind side of the lake. Uh, we do have a couple values up here in the interior western upper peninsula, uh, less than minus 40. So huge, huge impact that, uh, that, that the lake temperatures did have. Uh, one final thing here, too, in terms of ice cover on the Great Lakes collectively for the, the region as a whole. This is the growth here in blue. Uh, this is from uh, the Environment and Climate Change Canada and their ice service. Uh, the green is the normal for that particular week of the, uh, the season. But you can see that during that Arctic outbreak, our, our ice coverage shot up from less than half of normal to actually above normal for one week. And then after things uh, 
after that upper air pattern finally broke down and we got milder temperatures here, you can see a rapid drop off in the ice coverage right after that. So overall, with the exception of one week, it was much less ice cover than normal during uh, the past winter. One other interesting aspect as we move closer here to the present and where we are is that I, I, you saw in the one graphic for Muskegon, the, the temp, daily temperatures, we had a very warm, uh, mild March and the early part of April. And uh, we, we frequently don't think about this, but it's at the very, very front end of our, our warm season. But one of the things we also saw because of the mild temperatures, because of lots of sunny skies, uh, low humidities, we had an enhanced uh, rate of evaporation that, to take place. There actually I should say the potential rate of evaporation to take place. And it's what basically the how much water vapor can the atmosphere hold at a given time. And interestingly, if we look at the last couple months, and this is we're looking at that right now with a graphic called the uh, Evaporative Demand Drought Index, or EDI for short, this particular uh, index looks at, again, the atmospheric demand. And what it says is that for the last couple months, it's been unusually high across all of the Great Lakes region. All of these colors here are enhanced levels. And those here in the middle, the southern part of the basin, southeastern Michigan, northern Ohio, over into portions of extreme southern Ontario. These are, the, these are the highest rates that we've seen for the last two months in roughly about 20 years. This, this uh, index only goes back to 2010, so it is limited in terms of time, but it still indicates uh, at a time of the year where we typically don't see much evaporation, this year was different because of those mild temperatures. We had quite a bit of evaporation. That has led to a rapid drawdown combined with the lack of precipitation that we've already talked about in many parts of the basin to uh, lead to unusually low soil moisture levels. And that's what you see right here, uh, the actual anomalies here on the left. And then the one on the right is the change in uh, uh, soil moisture between the end of February and recently. And you can see it's still declined. And again, in our part of the world, it's, uh, it's fairly typical to start the, the warm season with quite a bit of moisture stored in the soil. We have a humid climate. It recharges virtually every year in the off season. This year, though, is, is one of the drier ones we've seen in some time. And that leaves us uh, the, the drought monitor here, which takes into account all of the, some of the issues that we've just talked about. It has uh, really made changes in the last several weeks. And you can see large portions of the basin now are in the D1 moderate drought category. And it wasn't too long ago, just a couple months, that there was virtually no dry, abnormal dryness or drought indicated anywhere. So that's that's happened relatively rapidly. And uh, again, one of the, I think, significant weather factors that we face right now. I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about where does this fit in long term. Well, here are mean annual temperatures. Uh, these are January through December. Looking back to 1895 in a long term time series here, you can see that 2020 uh, here, the last year, was certainly warmer than normal, but fairly close to where we've been over the last couple decades. And you can see the Overall upward trend in temperatures here, mean temperatures, certainly is upward, but there has been a leveling off uh, really in, uh, over the last 20 years. And you can see sort of a sideways trend here. But 2020, once again, was warmer than normal, but very, very consistent with where we've been recently. In terms of precip, uh, a little bit more interesting here, very, very distinct long-term trend. We've added uh, 10 to 15% and mean annual precipitation just in the last 50 or 60 years. But that said, 2020, here you can see just a, a little bit, uh, a few hundredths of an inch above the long-term 100-year normal, uh, which but the interesting thing, thing is relative to the last decade. It's one of the drier years that we've had here. And again, it comes off of last year, or, or I should say the year before, 2019, which was the record warmest year. Almost 10 inches difference between 2019 and 2020, or a 10 inch of uh, fall. This, and I, I should also note, this does not include the entire basin. This is just most of the central and southwestern portion of uh, the Great Lakes Basin, but I think it's fairly representative of what we see for the, the basin as a whole. So uh, the long-term trend is still distinctly up and wetter, but last year was a little bit of at least a break in that, uh, that pattern we've seen as of late. One last thing, uh, some of you probably have had seen mention or reference to this, and that is that uh, every, every, the first year of every new decade, uh, by international agreement, the atmospheric sciences uh, groups and uh, ministries and departments around the world collectively 
change their normals. And the, the 30-year time frame is used beginning in the, the again, the, the one year ending in one up for through 30 years. And where we've been until recently, we've had 1981 to 2010 as our normals period, but we just now have a new one, 1991 to 2020. And so there's 10 years difference. We, we got rid of the 80s on our new normals and we added the 20 teens or the 20, 2011 through 2020. And just to give you an idea, especially based on what we just saw, you can see that over virtually all of the lower 48, including the Great Lakes Basin, we've had a warming in our basin. It's on the order of about a quarter of a degree to about seven, 75 hundredths or three quarters of a degree Fahrenheit, the difference between those two. And just like we also saw again, we are wetter as normal. There are a couple areas which are very close, maybe even a little tiny decline, but by and large, the vast majority of our area uh, of our region here in uh, in the basin itself is wetter now with the new normals than they were before. So something to think about as you hear, uh, maybe a forecast or a value relative to normal. We have to take this into account and realize that the normals themselves are a little bit warmer and wetter uh, than they used to be. Well, let's look real quickly here uh, and I'll, I'll try to wrap up where are we headed. Well, one, I think one piece of news is especially after another frosty morning over much of the region here. It does appear finally that the uh, upper air pattern that's led to this, uh, well, fairly long standing cool dry period is beginning to break down. Uh, this is uh, the eight to 14 day outlook for the 17th through the 23rd of the month. And the big change is that uh, we have more of a troughing feature out over Western North America, resulting in more southwesterly flow, which should, should ultimately lead to a moderation in temperatures. And you can see our forecast for mean temperatures here in the upper right uh, is significantly in the upper or below, or warmer than normal, sorry, category here. It also suggests that there will be the storm track, which has primarily been suppressed to the south of the Great Lakes region, probably will move a little bit further northward and uh, that would bring uh, more, more chances for precipitation and overall a forecast of, of greater precipitation. And I, I think it's also significant to note here that both the six to 10 day and eight to 14 day, those medium range uh, outlooks are both in very, very strong agreement for this particular change. And it probably will begin uh, as early as later this week and into the upcoming weekend. So that is a, a change. And we look out beyond that, we've, we've come through here, uh, well, what's at least a, uh, probably a moderate La Nina event. Uh, on the left-hand side here uh, are forecasts of where we're headed here over the next several months. And the bottom line is that uh, there's still some cooler than normal water out here in the Eastern Pacific, but much less than we had earlier. But the official outlooks here call for a continued warming of this area back to near neutral and the neutrals here anywhere between uh, minus five and plus five degrees on this this particular index but then interest the uh, consolidation forecast that we typically follow is the one in blue here for the uh, the official outlook uh, after that it actually drops off again it becomes a little bit cooler here this fall could that be another a second uh, secondary la nina well we'll have to wait and see but right now the probabilities say very strongly that over the next one to two months that uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, that index is gonna be probably pretty close to neutral, at least into the summer before it, it changes again. So something to watch, probably doesn't have much of an influence really on our outlook as we, we look ahead here. And here's what the outlooks do suggest. First for the month of May, uh, they call for normal to below normal mean temperatures. And that's here on the upper left, and then uh, normal to above normal precipitation totals. So a little bit like, well, it's certainly with precip what we just saw, but the temperature forecast is different. A note, however, for the three month outlook, the May through July, uh, basically warmer than or milder than normal temperatures are favored over the entire continental US, including, including the Great Lakes region. And then a similar outlook here for precipitation, also uh, more in the direction of wetter than normal. So that's a long term, that's, that's what most of the guidance is suggesting. All, however, I would also note that there are some differences with some of the tools. So the confidence is maybe a little bit lower than it, it, uh, it is in some seasons. Uh, longer term, uh, looking out, what about the rest of the season? Well, as you can see on the left with mean temperature forecasts here, uh, these are all for the remainder of the warm season, all call for above normal mean temperatures or favor that. The precip's a little bit more complicated. And for the uh, middle summer period here, June through August, our, our, our traditional three month summer period, 
we're in the EC or equal chances category for most of the basin, maybe a little bit of wetter than normal for the lower lakes and, uh, and that part of the basin. But you can see at some point in time, maybe late summer, that some of this drier than normal forecast area out here approaches at least the west, far western portions of the basin. So uh, a little bit of an interesting, sort of a tough forecast, but I think that the take home is certainly towards warmer than normal. The other thing to note is too, that given the precipitation deficits that we've encountered in some of these uh, areas, uh, especially the southern and central portions of the basin, that's something we'll have to look at very carefully because if it does stay warmer than normal, and if precipitation's not at least normal, uh, there, we're gonna be more likely to run out of water for at least for vegetation. It certainly has, then uh, it also has impacts on the hydrology of the region as well. So that's gonna be something that we'll watch carefully over the next uh, several weeks. And with that, I'm gonna wrap things up and I'll, I'll have a look. If you have questions, you can uh, chat or we, uh, we can get a hold or we'll, I think we'll have a ch some chance for discussion here in a little bit. Uh, thanks, Doug. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, we're gonna uh, switch over to John and while he's uh, getting set up there, uh, remind folks that it was a good question here, are we gonna have a recording of this? And absolutely we will. Uh, we'll be putting it up on a, a website and Jennifer will be sending all of the attendees or actually anybody who registered a link to get to that within the next 24 to 48 hours or so, along with all the presentations in PDF form. So you'll, you'll, you'll have everything. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Uh, and oh, just another reminder, if you have any questions or things or comments even, uh, feel free to put them in the question interface. That's a good place to, uh, to put them so we can see them and get them, uh, at least get started on answering them. Uh, John, you're up. John comes from us from the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, and he's going to talk about the water levels and the outlooks. So thank you. Go ahead, John. All right, thanks. Are my is my slide up pretty good? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, good. All right, well, thanks. Um, yeah, so you all just got a real good overview of uh, you know conditions throughout the Great Lakes Basin uh, over the winter and spring here. So I'll translate that into what that's meant for water levels and talk about uh, what that means for water levels moving forward on the Great Lakes here. Uh, Uh, all right, before I do that, just a couple of basics uh, you know, that I want to cover about the Great Lakes Basin. I'm not going to go into a lot of details with this slide, um, but, you know, just wanted to serve a basic reminder of, you know, the Great Lakes are just an extremely large interconnected system here uh, with water flowing, you know, starting at the northern edge of the basin in Lake Superior, working its way generally southeast, uh, you know, eventually out of the Great Lakes system down the St. Lawrence River. Um, there are two points in in this system where uh, we actually do control outflow from one lake to the other, uh, which I have highlighted here. Um, you know, I could spend an hour talking about uh, how those are regulated and uh, institutions that take care of that. Uh, but you know, for the purposes of this presentation, the general takeaway is just that uh, generally Great Lakes water levels are influenced by Mother Nature. You know, although there's some influences due to regulation. It's, you know, generally going to be driven by what kind of weather conditions and water supplies we see. So that's really what I'll be talking about in this presentation. I also want to use a background slide here just to give you some context of uh, Great Lakes water levels and how they fluctuate over time. So uh, what you're looking at here is a plot of the monthly mean water level for each lake uh, covering our entire period of record that we have these supported monthly mean. Uh, levels which go from 1918 uh, through 2021 here and so th there's some key things that I would like to point out so you see these blue squiggly lines which are a lot of the monthly means uh, and you'll notice you know this up and down up and down up and down nature for each of the lakes so what you're seeing there are the typical seasonal cycles that each lake would go through uh, where you know the lakes typically uh, drop throughout the winter uh, as conditions are dry and more precip is falling in snow accumulating on the watershed. Uh, we typically see a spring rise, which we're starting right now, uh, peaking in the summer before again, you know, kind of hitting the fall and winter and going through another decline. So, so you, you see that bearing out here year after year. 
Uh, you'll also notice we have this red uh, long-term annual average line. Uh, so it gives you some reference to see where where we enter some periods of generally higher than average water levels and lower than average water levels. Uh, really, you know, if you look at uh, Lake Michigan and Huron, that's pretty pronounced where you see some pretty extended uh, low water periods and extended high water periods. And one thing I like to point out is that levels do generally transition between these high and low water periods. So if you look at over at the 2020, you look at kind of our recent past, uh, you'll see where we've, you know, 2020 and 2019, we've uh, been dealing with extremely high water levels, up setting new record highs. Uh, but if you look back over history, you see that we have these high periods uh, that have been roughly in the same uh, general area of the historical record as what we've been dealing with in the current high water period. Uh, the other thing to point out, uh, all those water levels do fluctuate between highs and lows. Uh, there really isn't any predictable, you know, period of the cycle. You can't really look back and see that, ah, yes, every uh, every seven years we transition from one, you know, high water period back to a low. You know, we, we, we cycle between these periods, but the length and the timing vary quite a bit over time. So uh, we continue to... Uh, Make sure people understand we do expect to continue to fluctuate between high and low periods. It's just very difficult to ever determine when you may switch from one to the other. All right, with that, I'll just uh, three slides here where I'll talk a little bit about basic conditions, building on uh, what Jeff talked about, a little bit of overlap, but uh, different ways to look at some of the information. Uh, so I thought this one was interesting to summarize uh, this past winter. Uh, again, you saw that we were light on snow throughout much of the basin, uh, and that bears itself out in this this product that uh, we monitor with the Army Corps uh, using NOAA information. And, and what you're looking at here is if you look over the entire basin of each of the lakes, uh, and if you were to track how much water was in that snowpack on average, uh, we that's, that's what we do. We, we come up with that average uh, for each of the lake basins, uh, and then we plot these throughout the season. So you see, uh, a lot of gray lines that are the tracks of how the snow water was building up in the snowpack uh, previous years. And then the blue line you see is uh, what happened this last year. So um, especially on the upper lakes where the snowpack uh, is a you know a much bigger uh, influence on you know, what kind of a spring rise you're going to see and the, again the total water supply to the lake. Uh, you see especially on Lake Superior uh, this blue track was about as low as uh, we've built up a total snow water uh, within the snowpack over the course of the season since this uh, product was created. Uh, I think it only goes back to 2009, so it's, this isn't a huge data set here, but uh, it gives you an idea, at least uh, you know, over the last uh, 12 years or so, this was uh, the least amount of snowpack, at least from a moisture content perspective, that we had uh, in the Superior Basin. Uh, Michigan and Huron, Michigan's a little bit more Difficult to see it kind of runs within the middle of the other historical lines, uh, but you see Huron was also you know very light on snow. So, um, so anyways, this just gives you another visual to see you know what you what you saw through other ways. But yes, uh, it was a year where we really did not have that much snow uh, and didn't build up the, the snowpack we've seen in some of these years past. I uh, won't really talk about this slide. This uh, this is really what Jeff uh, did a good job describing. Uh, just using other products, but we, yet similar to what he's shown, if you look back at the departure from from the mean for precip of April, that's what you're seeing on the left graphic, showing how much the basin was dry, which you've seen. Uh, if you look at it over the last 90 days uh, in that right-hand graphic, you just see how dry most of the Great Lakes Basin has been. So driving home the same points that you've already gotten. Uh, and then one final way to look uh, it's how dry conditions have been here, uh, is to look at uh, the stream flow. So all of the tributaries that are, you know, working water ultimately off of the land and down into the lake, uh, if you were to look at the stream flow in each of those and also then figure out, uh, you know, what, what the departure from a normal, you know, average uh, stream flow would be, uh, and this is looking at April, um, you, you can see in April of 2021 here, uh, we were much below normal for huge portions of the basin, which obviously that's not going to be very surprising uh, if your your precip is below normal. Um, 
but uh, the interesting point here, we included the graphic back from 2019, which is you know, really when things started to get consistently wet for us and you know, gave us the real high water level period we've been dealing with 2019, 2020. And, and you can see how building in April, May, and June of that year, you know, uh, stream flow was much above normal uh, during that period. So really quite a stark transition here uh, in the spring of 2021. Uh, compared to the conditions that we saw back in uh, spring of 2019. All right, so what, is, what does all that mean uh, from a water level uh, perspective? So I'll walk through each of the lakes here. We have our uh, most recent uh, six-month forecast uh, that we produced. Uh, this, again, this is something that the Army Corps produces. Uh, there's also a, a coordinated product with the uh, same numbers on the Canadian side, uh, produced by Environment Climate Change Canada. Uh, and let me tell, oh, many of you are probably familiar with this, but I'll walk you through what you're looking at here. Um, so you're seeing, again, a plot of the recorded monthly mean water levels. That's the red line. Uh, and again, you see this red line going back 2019 to present. Uh, so it gives you an idea of uh, what, how water levels have been over the last two years. Uh, you see this blue dash line. That's a plot of the uh, uh, long-term average monthly mean levels, so again, it gives you an idea of uh, where we are within respect to long-term average. Uh, and then we have these bars uh, at the top and kind of the bottom ranges of years. These are the uh, the record high levels for each month plotted above, and then the record low levels below with the years that those were set. So, um, so when when you look back, obviously over 2019, 2020, you can see water levels. About the period we set new record highs in 2019, uh, a couple of new level or record highs in 2020, uh, and then water levels have stayed generally high. Uh, but you'll notice here that we've started to get further and further beneath these, you know, the record highs that we were flirting with, you know, early in 2020. So you've seen the dryness result in you know, drop in levels, getting you know further away from those record highs. Um, for Lake Superior. The uh, April level here in 2021 was about six inches below the April uh, level last year, and uh, we're forecasting moving forward here. Oh, and I, you know, I guess I should point out that this green dashed line in here is the most probable water level of our forecast, uh, and then this is our 90% confidence interval that's shaded around it. So, you know, obviously, as the further you get out, you know, the forecast becomes much more uncertain because you can't predict. Uh, Water supplies as well that far out, but it gives you an idea of the range of expected levels here over the next six months. Um, and for Superior, we expect uh, to be about two to four inches below last year's levels uh, pretty consistently here over the next six months. So, moving down to Lakes Michigan and Huron, again, you know, same, you know, same graphic, I don't need to go over that. But you can see how last year we just ran right at record highs, set any record highs. You know, all the way through from January through August of last year. Um, but then again, you start to see some of this uh, kind of dry winter, spring start to take effect here, where uh, levels have steadily declined um, to the point that we've just now, you know, finally started to go into a seasonal rise for Michigan here on, uh, where typically we probably would have started, I think, uh, last month or March. So we've seen this long pronounced uh, seasonal decline uh, on Lake Michigan here on. Actually, I think that seasonal decline here from the peak last uh, summer to its decline here, or its you know, the bottom of the decline here this past April, uh, that's the largest seasonal decline Michigan and Huron's had since 2002. So uh, it's been a while since we've had uh, conditions dry enough to produce that large of a drop. Um, if you look at uh, April of 2021 and compare it back to April of 2020 when we were setting records, uh, we are about 14 inches below that April level last year, which again, that's the largest uh, drop between one April and another uh, since back uh, 98, 99. So, but anyways, this is a pretty significant effect of, you know, this, this dry weather is really making a noticeable impact uh, on water levels uh, here. And you're, again, you're seeing that bear out and how uh, the water levels in Michigan here are responding. Uh, if you, now start looking forward for the rest of the year about what we would expect. Uh, you can see we really are expecting levels to remain a good 16, 
uh, to even 24 inches if you look back to out in October, uh, beneath the record highs you know that we were at last year. So we've gotten substantial relief off of uh, record highs from last year due to this dry period. Um, you know, levels certainly still remain well above average. Uh, you know, or that's you know that's line here is roughly 17 to 19 inches above average still. So the water levels are still high. Uh, there will still be impacts, especially during uh, you know, any potential significant storm events. Um, but obviously, much uh, a much better story uh, this year with that extra, uh, you know, kind of 16 to 24 inches of relief uh, off of those record highs. Lake St. Clair, uh, you know, obviously much smaller lake, uh, going to follow, you know, very similar pattern to Michigan here on. So same story here. You're seeing the same high water period uh, and the same lowering, uh, you know, levels over this dry period. So similar story. Uh, it's about a 15 inch drop uh, this April compared to last year at the same time. Uh, again, we've got notes and notes here that you can see in the forecast we're expecting to be about 15 to 22 inches below those record highs from last year, uh, but still uh, 15, 16 inches above uh, long term average level. Again, similar story uh, when you look down to Lake Erie. You know, we've seen uh, the same. Uh, you know, the same drop uh, from one year to the next. Uh, I think when we looked it up, this drop uh, from April this year to last year, you know, we're 17 inches beneath where we were last April. Uh, and I think it was also since uh, 98, 99 that we had uh, that, that large of a drop uh, one April to the other. So, um, so same same dry conditions on the lower lakes have driven the same decline, uh, giving Erie also some relief off of those record high levels. Um, and again, you know, looking out over the next six months, we expect that to continue, staying roughly 15 to 21 inches beneath those previous record highs, yet still above average, you know, roughly a foot, uh, you know, remaining roughly a foot above those uh, long-term average levels. And lastly, uh, Lake Ontario, you can see really uh, Lake Ontario, the high water period that uh, was most problematic was back in 2019. Uh, levels started to moderate a little bit uh, last year in 2020, uh, and again, due to the dry conditions uh, throughout the Lake Ontario and uh, St. Lawrence River Basin area, uh, you know, we've been able to uh, manage water levels and flows, and you know, again, keep levels closer to average. Actually, uh, the bigger concern on the Lake Ontario side would be uh, if dry conditions continued; they may start to deal uh, with low water concerns. You know more than high water concerns here. So, um, so again, you see Lake Ontario a little bit different story than the upper lakes, uh, mostly due to the dryness and the influence that uh, regulation can have uh, on Lake Ontario. So, you can see the forecast calls for water levels to be generally below average uh, on Lake Ontario over the next. Week. For that, I think that covers. Uh, my topic. So if you'll, if you'll have access to this presentation. We like to include links to a lot of the products that you saw uh, and other products. So I encourage you to uh, check these out. Uh, hopefully you find some of them helpful. And again, I have time to answer some uh, questions related to all of this here in a little bit. So thank you. Thanks, John. We're going to shift over to Brandon here. And Brandon's with, with NOAA's Office of Coastal Management. Let's see, Brandon, I don't see anything yet. Yeah, I just want to make sure I get the right screen here. Okay, yep, yep. Perfect. Are you seeing my presentation and, okay, Doug? Yes, it's full screen and everything's ready to go. Thank you, Brandon. Right. Thanks, Doug. Take it away. Will do. So thanks everybody uh, for staying tuned in to this webinar. Um, so we've heard from Jeff about the inputs into the basin. We've heard from John about how those inputs are, are changing water levels um, and the trend that we're starting to see with the, the lower water levels. And what I plan to actually speak to is how these changes in water levels are ultimately having an impact along our coast. So if we think about the coast, it's one of the more challenging and more um, dynamic areas of our region. And 
you know, when you look at the shorelines of the Great Lakes, uh, you know, they are naturally dynamic. We see sediment moving around, and that's due to this interaction between the water levels, the landscape, you know, how we as people along the shoreline are altering it. Um, and so what we try to do is, you know, work towards a, a good understanding in how to manage all these different things that are happening. Um, but of course, the shorelines are complex. Uh, we just saw in John's presentation how those water levels are changing over time. Um, we've definitely heard about the newspaper articles and the photos that we've seen of the impacts with the recent high water levels, with you know the impacts to dunes and, and people protecting the shorelines. And so it's trying to strike a, a balance with all of this. And then of course too, um, you know, the Great Lakes are, are an economic powerhouse as well. And so there are some of those connections associated with cost to build up against these high water levels, or how do we protect marine transportation during periods of low water levels? And so ideally, you know, what we're working towards is protecting the coastal communities and, and improving the resiliency of all sectors uh, moving forward. And so today I'll be talking a little bit about that complexity associated with water levels, the impacts that we're seeing to our shorelines, and again, uh, economic and social impacts from, from these changes. To start off, uh, we'll look at the water levels. And uh, I haven't seen this graphic yet on any of the presentations, so, so feel pretty good about this. But, um, you know, as John pointed out, we use a network of, of water level stations across the Great Lakes on both the U.S. side and the Canadian side to help with that coordinated uh, reporting of water levels um, for the monthly averages uh, moving forward. And that's what helps to regulate those various flows, as well as get an understanding of the changes um, on the water level surfaces within each of the basins. And so moving forward here, I'm going to be showing uh, some information as it relates primarily uh, using the U.S. side, so the NOAA uh, co-ops water level stations and what I'm going to be presenting next. So looking at Lake Superior and kind of building off of what John just presented, um, you know, he showed the graph of water level changes over time and how they go up, they go down, there's no real clear trend. Uh, but another way of looking at this is actually through the frequency of all those different water levels. And so the graph on the right is actually showing that distribution of the various water level frequencies. And we can see um, in Superior here that we range from uh, 599.47 feet uh, for the minimum water level reported during the monthly averages to a high of 603.37 feet. And so for Lake Superior as a whole, using these numbers, you can see that it's about four feet of change um, between the record high and record low. The other lines that you'll see also on this graph are the low water datum. Um, again, what John was referencing to in his forecast graphics. Uh, but then you'll also see a yellow line here and that's showing the long-term average that's reported through Glural's water level dashboard, as well as through that blue line that you just saw on the forecast graphics from John. And then the other thing that you'll see plotted here was actually the water level as it was in December of 2020. So you can see where uh, the recent period of high water levels from 2020 at the end there of the year are also plotting out in this distribution of water levels. And so while it's great to think about the, the lakes as a whole, where it gets really confusing to some of the coastal uh, folks is when we start talking about monthly average water level values, but then we also start to see differences in water values um, unique to each of the different gauging stations. So I mentioned the difference in water levels for Lake Superior, if we look at those monthly averages, is just over, or just under, sorry, four feet. However, if you actually look at the absolute range as it relates to each of these uh, NOAA co-op stations, is closer to six feet um, of change between record highs and record lows as they're recorded. And again, these are just the US stations that we're looking at here. And so when you're starting to think about how do we build a resilient shoreline or, or coastal communities, it's, you know, which water levels or which numbers should I be looking at? And what we encourage people to do is, you know, take a look at the local uh, water level station but then also understand long-term trends um, associated with that. And that's why it's really important to look at those water level forecasts that John just presented by the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as tools like Littoral's Water Level Dashboard to see those trends over time. And then also look at the more localized impacts from different uh, events. And in the case with the NOAA co-ops water level stations, they're also capturing a lot of these coastal storm events um, 
and that we see, you know, including Seish events um, or these different uh, meadow tsunamis that come through the area as well. And so again, you can think about how water levels change over time. Uh, you can see here where different water level records were set uh, for each of the stations, both in terms of the max and the min dates. Um, and so again, for example, Duluth uh, in October 21st of 2019 set a new record of 604.75 feet. And when you look at the maximum water level as reported through the monthly averages, it was only 603.37 feet. And so for coastal engineers, it's really important to understand that local versus lake-wide basin in terms of these values. We can look at you know, each of these lakes. So here's Michigan Huron. Um, in looking at monthly averages, it's a difference of just over six feet. Um, and it's kind of this bimodal uh, distribution that you'll see. And again, when you look at each lake individually, so here's the Lake Michigan water level stations. Um, you've got places like Calumet that have actually seen a change almost close to nine feet in water level changes. Um, and again, comparing back to the difference for the basin as a whole, it's around six feet of change. And the reason I'm highlighting these uh, unique differences is that again, is we try to think about building a resilient shoreline it's to take into account that, you know, we may not always be capturing the water levels as they're presented. And so it's really important to look at these localized impacts um, throughout. And again, in, in the Huron uh, Basin itself, uh, here you can see that at Essexville, Michigan, you know, they actually have the highest recorded water level above the low water datum, as well as below low water datum. And so they've dealt with close to 11 feet of water level change. Um, again, this isn't just, uh, you know, within one event, um, but over time. Uh, so from the max recorded in uh, January of 2020 to the min that was recorded in December of 2007. We can look at Lake St. Clair. Um, again, what's really interesting with Lake St. Clair is it has one of the largest differences in the min and max water levels um, at seven feet. And when you start to look at the actual station, here's where it gets really interesting is that that difference that we're seeing with the monthly average values is actually capturing a lot of the influence from the Canadian stations as well. And so the station that uh, NOAA reports on for Lake St. Clair at St. Clair Shores, um, Michigan there, it's you know an absolute range of between uh, or just over six feet of water level changes uh, in time. Lake Erie is also a very interesting lake um, because of its shallow nature that we start to see some really significant changes in water levels as well. And so for Lake Erie, uh, difference uh, based off of the monthly averages is 6.43 feet. However, when we start to factor in coastal storms and some of those changes associated with SASH events, uh, you're looking at close to an absolute range of just over 17 feet. And what's really interesting here and i'll see if i can uh, get this to you oops sorry uh it's not going to do it um but what's really interesting here is you look at when uh buffalo new york experienced its maximum high water level it was on january 30th of 2008 and then you go down and look at when toledo experienced its minimum it was on the same date and we had close to that 17 or over 17 foot change in water levels between Toledo, Ohio and Buffalo, New York. And again, that you know reflects on how these stations can completely alter the water levels depending if you're on the east end or the west end of a particular lake, north and south, uh, similarly for say lakes like Lake Michigan. And so again, when you think about a coastal engineer in the city of Toledo trying to figure out how do we compensate or build resiliency against potentially 14 feet change in water levels. And again, this isn't happening spontaneously or, or within 24 hours, um, but it is that range to, to think about when you're building infrastructure or nature-based solutions to accommodate these large changes in water levels. Lastly, we'll look at uh, Lake Ontario. And as John already pointed out, if you look at the graphic here, for example, the long-term average here is this yellow line and even in December of 2020, the water levels were sitting below the long-term average in Lake Ontario. And so 
Here we see a difference between the minimum and maximum of 7.12 feet. And again, it looks, you know, just looking at this, this graphic or this table of NOAA co-ops water level stations, that range is only six and a half feet, but it's not accounting again for those Canadian stations that may be reflecting even larger changes um, between the record high and record low at each of the water level stations moving forward. So with those water level changes over time, um, you know, during the last period of high water levels, we were seeing quite a bit of coastal flooding. Along with that, we were seeing additional shoreline erosion, bluff erosions, um, you know, the impacts to, to people's private property. Uh, we started to see increased sediment transport in the littoral zone as new sediments are being mobilized and washed along the shoreline. And here you can actually see a photo um, along Lake Michigan, this is just a little bit north of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and you can start to see that sediment transport actually in and along the shoreline here as well. With the increased sedimentation, we do see alterations occurring to streams and river miles. Um, those streams and river miles may either be contributing additional uh, sediment loading into the, uh, the river mouth, or they may start to be closed off as the sediment along the shoreline is, uh, you know, overcompensating or, or uh, building up against the, the stream flow itself, especially if there's not been any large precip events to help flush those river mouths uh, out. We're also starting to see loss of coastal terrestrial and wetland habitat um, with the high water levels, but as, again, these water levels start to recede. We may, may see, you know, new beach areas or new um, sediment where it was being transported, uh, deposited and creation of new uh, habitats potentially for uh, various terrestrial uh, critters. And then uh, when we had these high water levels, we were also starting to see some of the impacts when storms would move through the system. Uh, I mentioned the Duluth 2019 storm event. And again, with that high water levels and then throw a storm on top of that, that's what led to the measurements we were seeing at the co-op station in Duluth. So if we look at the composition of our Great Lakes shoreline, and again, this is just strictly the US side of the shorelines. We're still waiting to get data completed on the Canadian side. Um, but in general, uh, just over one fifth of the US shoreline is considered artificial or man-made. Um, so this includes things like the breakwaters, jetties, um, or other hardened structures along the shoreline to protect uh, private and public properties. We can look at uh, the composition of wetlands that remain, and we're just under one fifth, um, around 19.3% uh, of the natural shoreline remains as wetlands. We have bedrock that makes up a big chunk of it, as well as elevated shorelines. And then um, I break it down into fine and coarse sediment beaches here as well, uh, because those fine sediment beaches are, are more, more likely to be mobilized with changes in water levels um, compared to, say, coarse sediment beaches like a pebble beach or a cobble beach. And so if we look at the, the map of the distribution of artificial uh, shorelines across the Great Lakes, as I mentioned already, you know, over one fifth of the U.S. Great Lakes is classified as artificial or hardened. And so big chunks, of course, of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, um, as well as uh, southwestern Lake Michigan, are classified as artificial or hardened. And again, this is associated with a lot of the industrial uh, you know, complexes that we've seen built up in the Great Lakes um, with manufacturing and transportation of iron ore and making steel and, and other industrial goods. And the other part of this data set too allows us to actually assess the condition of those structures as well. And so the good thing is, um, you know, close to um, over 75% of, of the shoreline is either moderate, good, or, or high quality. And we're just seeing just under you know, 10% uh, considered poor quality. And what we mean by poor quality is that it has a likelihood of failing in the next, say, uh, five years or so, uh, just due to you know, use and abuse by the lake, but then also to it, it, the opportunity to, to replace these structures given their age um, over time. I mentioned the fine shorelines or fine uh, sediment shorelines and so the beaches that come to mind. Um, over 16% of the Great Lakes U.S. shoreline 
is classified as, as fine sediment beaches. And of course, that high concentration that we see is associated with Lake Michigan, especially the eastern side of the lake there with the large sand dunes um, and bluff structures there, as well as southwestern, um, you know, near Kenosha, Wisconsin, and the sand plains of uh, northeastern Illinois as well. And again, the reason to highlight these are given the fact that they are highly dynamic and susceptible to those changes in water levels uh, that we've previously been discussing and being mobilized and transported. Um, so we do see sediment moving you know, down from Wisconsin and into Illinois and Indiana as well. And again, similarly on the Michigan side uh, too. And if we look at the distribution of wetlands, um, you know, it's this was actually really interesting to first see, but a lot of that is sitting right there in the middle of the basin. So the northern portion of Lake Michigan, uh, obviously through the St. Mary's River corridor, some of the pocket wetlands in Lake Superior, and then the uh, Saginaw Bay through uh, Lake St. Clair into Western Lake Erie as well. And then again, the Eastern end of Lake Ontario. And the importance of these, of course, is the habitat that they create, um, you know, from fish spawning to migratory bird corridors. And so they are respond, responding to these changes in water levels over time. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens now as water levels continue to recede, or, or at least, you know, for the next six months, as John uh, was showing in the forecast, how these wetlands will respond in time. I mentioned some of the physical impacts. Um, this is one area where we're doing an on-the-ground study with the Illinois State Geological Survey and the Illinois Coastal Management Program in understanding, you know, how these landscapes change over time. And so you can see here at Illinois Beach State Park, uh, where we've seen significant erosion between 2008 and 2018. And of course, the question is, well, where is this material going? And you can actually see when you look at the data. Um, and what you're seeing on the far right is uh, bathymetry derived from topobathy lidar. And you can see the areas highlighted in red being those erosion areas, but then you're also seeing blue. And this is actually where we're seeing littoral um, sediment transport uh, between these areas. So you can see that it's not just uniform across uh, the near shore environments. You can see, for example, here where there's a water intake pipeline and just downstream of that, some of the erosion that we're seeing associated with that. The other thing that may be hard to see on the screens here is we're actually seeing, um, this is actually a former roadway um, that has been underwater since the 1970s. And that has of course been, you know, there was land at one point all the way even out further here. And that has now since continued to erode to the west here um, near, in Illinois Beach State Park. And similarly, we were seeing some structures um, that were put in place there to actually help with erosion, um, but have since uh, no longer been providing that, that support and protecting the shoreline um, in this uh, northern part closer to the marina. And so, you know, this has a direct impact to these coastal wetlands. There, there are still remnants along the shoreline here, um, but then also to the alteration to the habitat um, here, you know, in terms of uh, piping plover and other shorebirds that may be using uh, the shoreline for, for critical habitat. I mentioned too, it's not just the physical, but also economic and social impacts that we see. Um, obviously, there's a cost associated with the damage to coastal infrastructure. Um, you know, is it, do we spend the money to rebuild, to build back stronger, or you know, is it just one of these things where we call it a loss and have to retreat from the shoreline? There's a cost associated with that as well. We've seen impacts to recreation, including, you know, flooded marinas and docks during the, the period of high water levels over the last couple of years, the alterations or, or shrinking uh, beaches for recreational use. Um, but then too, what often we see in the news are those damage and loss of private property seeing houses being pulled down the, the bluff or, or down the dune uh, towards the lake. And so, you know, there's an emotional connection to all this as well. And, you know, there's the term nostalgia or distress caused by environmental change. And seeing the loss of private property or seeing the loss of a geography that's significant to us along the shorelines can cause some distress um, to various individuals. Um, some, it, you know, it's a it's a huge loss. For some, it's just seeing this change over time 
And, you know, that's where we got married, but now it's, you know, 20 feet offshore in the middle of the lake. Um, so there's those definite social and economic impacts with all this as well. NOAA's Office for Coastal Management um, tries to provide quite a few resources through the digital coast. And so we provide data, tools, and training resources. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the Lake Level Viewer. Uh, just some news on that. We are actually uh, looking to do some updates to the visualizations within that tool. We finally received some funding for that to, to improve some of the, add additional locations than the 10 that we currently have in there. And then we're hoping to do a revamp to the entire tool. It's one of our oldest tools now on Digital Coast and uh, give it a new, uh, I guess you could say, coat of paint um, with newer data and newer visualizations uh, within that tool in the upcoming years. I mentioned data. We have several um, terabytes worth of coastal nearshore bathymetry and topobathy LIDAR and terrestrial LIDAR that we host through uh, the Digital Coast through the Data Access Viewer. And then lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a lot of the trainings that our staff provides um, to coastal communities and others, uh, both in person. Of course, we've been holding back on in person with the, the pandemic, but we've been converting a lot of those from in person to virtual trainings now. And so there's several new resources that may have previously just been an in person, they're now virtual. So I encourage folks to, to take another look if they haven't in a while. Um, at those trainings that are available. And several are uh, focused on adaptation. You know, how do you do risk communication? How do you adapt to climate change? Uh, how do you implement nature-based solutions along the shoreline? So if you haven't been there, I highly recommend checking that out um, if, when you have time. And lastly, we work very closely with eight of the greatest, um, and I'll be biased of course here, but eight Great Lakes, uh, Coastal Zone Management Programs. And so I highly encourage uh, each of you, if you haven't, uh, reach out to your state Coastal Zone Management Program. They're a wealth of knowledge as well as resources to help with more of that local on the ground. How do we deal with the impacts that we're seeing? And so again, uh, encourage all of you to, to reach out to them uh, for more localized information uh, that I wasn't able to provide in this presentation. So with that, I'll just say thank you and Doug, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Brendan. <clears throat> um, let me get Gary set up here. All right, hey, uh, so Gary is uh, from the National Weather Service. Yep, we well, see your screen there. He's gonna give a weather service perspective on uh, Great Lakes water levels and what they do. Um, all right, thanks, Doug. Um, is my, yep. sc my screen's okay? Yes, Gary. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Gary Garnett, meteorologist for National Weather Service in Cleveland. I just um, want to talk about uh, some of the functions that we do uh, with w uh, water levels. Uh, the mission of the National Weather Service is to uh, issue forecasts and warnings for the protection of life and property and uh, issuing warnings, watches, advisories for lake levels is, of course, under our responsibilities. Um, we've learned a lot over the last few years uh, with the water levels being at near, near record uh, levels for the last several years, we've learned a lot about impacts. Uh, as we get these episodic weather events uh, come across the lake, obviously it impacts the water levels uh, depending on wind direction uh, the water levels can, uh, you know, be, be pushed up or down in different areas of the lake. Of course, you add wave action on top of that, which also can have significant impacts uh, to areas and communities uh, along the shorelines. So we've um, we really calibrated things here over the last couple of years. I'll show you in a minute. Um, the different products that we issue uh, when we get these weather events over the lakes that, that are going to have impacts. Our lakeshore warning, which uh, when we issue a warning, there's significant coastal flooding uh, is occurring or, or imminent. Uh, a lakeshore flood watch means either just minor coastal flooding or there's a potential uh, for a bigger event within the next few days. And a few offices also will issue uh, on the Western Lakes a lakeshore uh, advisory. 
This is what the actual light shore flood warning looks like when it's issued uh, from a National Weather Service office. This one happened to be issued uh, by the Buffalo office um, in, in 2020. Um, there are two areas I've, I've highlighted that are uh, really of significant interest in this warning. And the first one is the warnings in effect uh, time frame from noon uh, till 8 a.m. Tuesday. So you can see when it starts, when it begins. But the most important area other than the location are the impacts. Uh, where the water is going to come up, uh, where is it going to impact in this case? Uh, Lake Erie, Upper Niagara River Shores, uh, and different areas here. You can see Hamburg, Buffalo Harbor, uh, Canal Side, Dunkirk Harbor, so on and so forth. Um, but the impact there is where we've really made progress. Uh, this is a guidance sheet uh, that we use, happen to use in the National Weather Service Office in Cleveland. Uh, in this example, it, it includes impacts for a, a uh, northeast wind uh, over in the, the top chart here, which I'll use as an example, happens to be at the Toledo gauge. Uh, the one on the bottom would be at the Marblehead gauge. But in this example, depending on the strength of the winds, uh, what our expected water level would be at Toledo, uh, we have what the impacts would be. Uh, for example, if we were forecasting a wind of a northeast wind of 20 to 34 knots here, which is about the, uh, the, the fourth one down, uh, we would expect the water level to be between 80 to, two, 80 to 92 inches at Toledo, uh, which would give us um, uh, our warning criteria, red, a, a significant flooding impact, and some flooding would occur in, in uh, portions of Oregon townships. Um, so we've, uh, many of the weather service offices uh, across the Great Lakes have been able to develop guidance charts like this based on water level stations and information we've got from different weather events. A lot of mitigation has occurred in areas um, to help prevent damage and flooding. Um, so we continually calibrate this, but this gives us a ballpark idea of where to be uh, when we have a, a weather event to come through, then we're going to forecast certain water level uh, at certain stations. So once we issue a, a Lakeshore flood watch or warning, um, we will issue different graphics uh, to get that information out. Uh, so people can take precautions. Um, this graphic here is an example of one that we would issue maybe for social media. You would see this on Twitter, you would see it on Facebook. Maybe you'd see it on a web page. Once again, the key information, uh, the timing of the event, this one happens to be noon Monday to noon Tuesday. What to expect, which is uh, the impacts. And then we have a nice graphic, which you could uh, can actually geographically see where the Lakeshore Watch would be, in this case, parts of Lake and Ashtabula counties in Ohio, and a Lakeshore flood warning in, in Erie, Pennsylvania. So this would be a common graphic um, on most social media platforms. Uh, this example of uh, a graphics a, a little more involved. Uh, this would be a briefing maybe that our weather service office would issue to decision makers in local communities uh, that would be maybe uh, you know, blocking off roads or alerting the public of this event and, and what the impacts could be. Uh, somewhat similar to our general graphic, just goes in a lot more detail here. Uh, in the upper left, you can see the, the graphics showing where the lakeshore flood warning would be in effect, the time frame. Um, a nice graphic here in the lower left corner showing you the impacts of this event, whether it's elevated, significant, extreme, and in this case, it's significant to extreme. Um, and then here on the right, uh, the, the flood warning summary uh, showing the impacts, uh, uh, you know, maybe exceeding 10 feet at Buffalo. And then again, once again, the flooding in the different locations uh, that that would occur. As I mentioned earlier, um, these weather events uh, have significant uh, impacts, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, on the levels of the lake. Uh, the winds in particular, particularly when they're sustained and they're strong, will push the water around. Uh, you add wave action onto that. And, uh, you know, you can take a bad situation of high lake levels and make it significantly worse. 
Um, so we do pay obviously very close attention to the exact wind direction, speeds, wave heights, um, because a small change in wind direction can totally change the impacts and the location of the impacts uh, that are expected. Uh, these are just some graphics that are shown here. They, these are actually our forecast graphics, but they're on the uh, uh, NOAA Glarel Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System. Uh, but for this example here in the upper left, you can see we have a westerly, a little bit southwest wind uh, going across the lake, uh, much stronger on the east end. Um, the graphic here in the upper right showing you the wave height. Obviously, as the winds go down the long uh, lake, uh, the waves increase with time, um, showing the higher waves uh, on the eastern end. Um, water displacement occurred by a weather event like this can be can really be significant. Uh, Lake Erie's a shallow lake, so the impacts are much more substantial uh, on this lake than it would be on, on others. So, for example, uh, here the red, the red line shows uh, the forecast in Buffalo for this, where the water level could be pushed upwards as much as six feet uh, above the current levels. And then the blue line showing you so where there would be a drop of six feet. And uh, the graphic yeah. the lower right shows the, uh, the uh, sort of a graphical view of the displacement with the red showing the water increase in height uh, to near six feet and then the drop on the Western Basin. So, um, you know, the, the weather obviously drives a very important impact um, when we, we have these events. Something that the National Weather Service in Detroit is experimenting with are what are called probabilistic graphics. Um, and, and these can be very useful for you to assess your own risk. Um, unfortunately, these graphics are only being uh, uh, used right now in Saint Clay, Saint, uh, Lake St. Clair and um, Lake Huron. I think this one happens to be for Port Huron. Um, but the two graphics down on the lower part are what I want to bring your attention to. And um, this would be an example of a weather event coming through. Um, and then the probability of reaching certain wind criteria. You know, if you happen to know that, you know, uh, 40 knot winds uh, from the east uh, give you flooding events typically, well, what are the probabilities I'm going to get 40 knot winds? Well, the 42 knot winds is this orange area. And you can see on April 13th, right around 3 to 4 p.m., somewhere in this period, there was about a, oh, maybe 15 to 18% chance that you would get winds that strong. Now, if you had problems with 30 knot winds, um, or yellow or 33 knot winds, and you could see the probability in that same time period of maybe 3 to 6 p.m. of getting, you know, 33 knot winds is almost 80%. So the probability in that situation, if 30 knot winds are giving you problems, uh, would be very high with this event. Similar thing for the wave distribution, the graphic here on the lower right. Um, you know, if waves of, you know, maybe nine feet uh, were the ones you're most worried about, give you the most problem, maybe beach erosion or, or flooding, you know, what are the probabilities that I'm going to get waves of nine feet with this weather event in the April 13th in the afternoon? It was less than 10 percent. But if waves of six feet, which are the blue, were a concern, you could see that the peak here, April 13th in the afternoon, was somewhere up around 40 percent. So these graphs, these graphics are, are very helpful in assisting you uh, of determining what your threat would be if you know a particular wind uh, direction, wind speed, and, and wave uh, cause, cause problems for your location. There are several offices around the Great Lakes National Weather Service offices that are issuing these type of uh, products and information for lakeshore flooding. Uh, this graphic shows you which offices uh, across the lakes have responsibility for, for you know, different areas of lakes. You can see there's quite a few. Um, so if you um, can identify where you're at on the lakes, obviously, please get a hold of your local National Weather Service Office for information uh, directly from them. 
And you can get to the National Weather Service offices a couple of different ways, either using weather.gov and clicking on the map um, will drive you down directly to your local weather office. Another great site, which is very marine specific for weather information in the Great Lakes regions, weather.gov slash Great Lakes. Um, there's all kinds of graphics and information very specific to the Great Lakes uh, marine community, including ice information. Uh, that's on that website. And Doug, that is all I have. So I will toss it back to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, let's, uh, for interest of, time, whoops, interest of time and such, let's uh, go right to uh, questions. Again, if anybody has any additional questions, you can type them into the uh, question tab, if you will, on the uh, go to webinar interface and I think before we get started with the questions I think uh, Jennifer had a, a comment she would like to make or maybe in, introduce herself sure hi thank you Doug and hi everyone this is Jennifer Day I'm NOAA's Great Lakes Regional Coordinator and um, I run our NOAA Great Lakes Regional Collaboration Team which is a team um, of folks across all of NOAA and across all of our line office and, and many of our core partners around the region. And we've developed a new um, fact sheet um, that I have put the, um, the uh, link to in um, the handouts section of your dashboard and also put the link in the chat um that talks about all the different water level products and services that NOAA offers across all of NOAA. Um, there are many many different products and services and so if you want to take a look at that all those links are live and they will take you right to those sites for all the different types of things we offer. So um, we just um, finished that on Friday so you've got the the first look at it and um and actually for those who might have um, joined us a little late i will repost that in the chat as well okay <clears throat> thank you uh and again the recording will be the recording will be made available to you in the next 24 to 48 hours as well as all the <clears throat> files uh pre presentation files from all four of our speakers who i do want to thank uh very much for your time and effort on that they're always a uh, packed full of information. Uh, one of the questions that we had was when <laughs> when should we put our tomato plants out? And and, and I think uh, Jeff addressed that in the uh, chat section, but or in the question section. But Jeff, do you want to just say a little bit more about that? There's also a question for Gary, actually. But go ahead, Jeff. Sure. And I, yeah, j jump in, uh, and Gary. You want to? It's uh. Uh, the I think the smart aleck question, response to the question is it's it's uh, it's never you never can put the tomato plants out in, in Michigan but uh, in actuality we we've got a couple more nights uh, unfortunately of this uh, unusually cold uh, air mass that we're in and then it looks like some moderation but tomatoes are a relatively sensitive uh, crop or plant and you're going to have to be careful and. I think we've all learned the hard way if you've done this uh, over the years that you really, if you really want to be safe, you wait till almost into Memorial Day where you're, because climatologically that's what the statistics tell us. And interestingly enough, the, the, the dates of the average dates of the last freezing temperatures of the spring are getting earlier with time. And it's, it's, it's noticeable over the last few decades, but even that uh, we can, we have still reported uh, or recorded Freezing temperatures, and I'm, I'm thinking now about the Saginaw area. It, it varies, of course, by location in the region, but uh, you really need to go into late May to completely cancel or, or, or rule it out. So there's still a chance, even though the, the forecasts don't call for it. So as I, I mentioned in the response, uh, and this is the way my, my household works here, you, you've always just got to be ready for surprises and have the covers ready to go. Uh, watch your short-term forecasts. Uh, and, and just be ready, be ready, or uh, better, better safe than sorry. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jeff. Um, there was there was a quick question about uh, why there's not data for the Green Bay East complexity of the water level uh, on the water level slides, and um, I think Brandon, Brandon, why don't you just go ahead and say what you said there? Currently missing an instrument or something. 
Oh, let me see if I can unmute you there. There we go. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Yeah, so when I was pulling in those numbers, uh, that information was currently not available Green Bay East. Um, but yeah, you can. Uh, I provided a link to the station itself if, if people want to get additional water level information for that particular station, Doug. Okay. Um, and this is really open to anybody, but who's, who's at fault for the receding land and wetland destruction that we're seeing along the sides, if there is any fault? To be had, uh, and this may be more of opinion. And I'm not. If we have the right speakers on here, that's great. If we don't, uh, we can say that. Anybody want to address that, Brandon? You 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 started that a little bit. Yeah, um, I was trying to summarize it in a, a short paragraph here, Doug. Um, you know, it really is difficult to say who's at fault um, because, as I mentioned, you know what's happening upshore may have an impact downshore, uh, especially as it relates to littoral sediment transport and some of the processes that we see at play there. Um, obviously, you know, it's easy to see when a wetland's filled in because of anthropogenic change or development, um, you know, what's going on there. And, and ideally, they should be offsetting that with any type of development. Um, and then, um, two, you know, what we saw with this recent period of high water levels was just how quickly water levels jumped and i don't know if john wants to talk to, about that um or or jeff too in regards to the inputs but you know these ecosystems have to have that ability to naturally respond at a given rate um and if there's you know if you're you know increasing water levels and then having these large storm events that can blow down the aquatic vegetation the, the ecosystem itself, the wetlands, can't respond as quickly as how quickly those water levels are changing over time. And so, and then lastly, too, you know, we may be trying to preserve wetlands, but then it's in a buffer, right? And so there might be a roadway or, or other development that's preventing that landward. As water levels go up, ideally those wetlands would kind of migrate along with those changes in water levels. But if they're not able to naturally migrate, that can also have a detrimental impact um, to the wetlands as well. So I don't know if John or Jeff, you guys want to explain any further in regards to, to the rapid changes we saw with water levels during this last period, but those are just a few of the factors um, that can be in play, Doug. Anybody else? Want to comment, I should say? Okay, um, anybody understand the, uh, or anybody on this call an expert on wildlife and some of the impacts or have heard or seen media reports, whatever, uh, in terms of wildlife um, uh, from the impacts of high water levels. I think you just addressed some of that in terms of uh, uh, yeah, some, some of that in terms of wetlands, yeah. Yeah, this is Brandon. And so to, to add to that, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, you know, as water levels change, I mentioned the loss of beaches for recreational use, but also too that, you know, those are habitats uh, for shorebirds like piping plover. Um, so if you have a limited area, you're reducing that habitat area that can be used uh, by those. Um, additionally, I highlighted, you know, some of the sediment transport that we see happening in the near shore. And what can happen is if those fine materials go further offshore, they can start to uh, sediment, uh, add additional fine sedimentation into fish spawning areas. And so what may have been suitable for, for fish spawning and you know laying their eggs in between the rocks and cobbles and things like that may be infilled with the finer sediments. And so you start to lose some of those spawning grounds that would be used for on the by the fish um, in those areas as well. Okay. Um, we did have a question about algae al algal blooms, but um, we may or may not have uh, uh, the right folks on here. I'll, I will tell you what, though, uh, Carter, is if you write an email to uh, either me or Jen Day or anybody on this call, we will uh, we will get back to you with someone who can address that a little bit better. Uh, I, I'm guessing what you're asking is what's the what's the forecast, if you will, for this year, and that's very dependent on a whole bunch of stuff that hasn't happened yet. Um, anybody want to say anything about algal blooms generally? 
Well, I, I can say this is Garrett. I can I can say a little bit, and and Doug, you kind of hit the hit the nail on the head. Um, the the spring is the loading season, um, and the precipitation mainly March, April, May time frame really set the foundation uh, for what the bloom will do during the summer, and uh, they will start doing some uh, forecasting updates as we get to the uh, uh, end of May, early part of June the uh, early season stuff will, will will start to come out, but it's just still a little bit early to, to speculate on at this point. All right, thank you, Gary. Uh, another question is about what are some of the long-term effects on jetties and rock protection that <clears throat> was put along the lake to save properties? Uh, I guess specifically along the west coast of Michigan and had so many changes made. What are some of the long-term effects of the jetties and rock protection? Any comments on uh, that? John Ellis, I can, I can offer some comments. I don't know if Brandon wants to offer any too. Um, you, know, I, you know, I guess a couple of the, the longer-term changes would be, you know, one, you know, obviously, you know, people are doing that to protect their property. So, you know, they're offering protection, you know, to private property, but I guess the, the downside that can happen as uh, start to accumulate larger stretches of armored shoreline, uh, you do start to, you know, deny material that would have been, you know, taken back into the lake that would have added to the sand supply that moves up and down the shoreline. Uh, so you do start to starve some of that natural, uh, that natural sediment supply into the littoral system, which can manifest itself potentially as you know, smaller beaches uh, in the future, you know, less sand, uh, you know, more, more kind of a rocky characteristic. So that is, that is something that, you know, that from the Army Corps perspective, we're trying to put more research and information to to get a better understanding of just you know, how large of an impact that can be over time as a larger percentage of the shoreline is armored. And this is Brandon. And not, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just add on to what John said, you know, it's it's actually one of the things we're looking at right now is, you know, when you start to lose that natural sediment deposition or, you know, the materials being eroded off the landscape, um, you know, instead of sand being naturally brought into your beach, now there's the financial associated with you having to actually ship sand to your beach. And so there's a, you know, potentially down the road, more costs associated with maintaining those recreational opportunities. The other thing I'll point out too is we're working very closely with the coastal programs. Um, and for example, Melanie Perello, who's up with the uh, Minnesota Lake Superior Coastal Program, they've actually seen in the last, I think it's two to three years, a 1700% increase in shoreline armoring along uh, Minnesota's shoreline um, due to the high water levels. So, you know, there's definitely these now long term impacts to think about um, with this additional armoring that's, that's coming into the system. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions, then we, we got to wrap it up here, but is Ontario low due to precipitation, lack of, or other factors involved? And I, I, John, I don't know if that's you or... Yeah, I can... Someone else. I, I can mostly answer that. Yeah, it, it is really just because of the dry conditions that we've had. That's really the, the main driver. So the upper lake and, you know, all the way through Erie and Ontario, that same very dry pattern that, that's really been the influence simply and and, and john also, uh, doug I'll, oh, I'll add to that um just because of some of the other work we do that i mean obviously um, as john said there's a lot of natural factors that uh, play up into ontario being low but i know i think over the winter um the um on the board of control were, were they were letting extra water out um in preparation for what could have been a high spring um so i think that was also adding a little bit to those um reduced levels on ontario and then yeah, finally, and uh, certainly the board oh, would be ahead. better to, yeah, if anybody on this right. webinar wants to follow up on that you know i'd definitely follow up with the you know, ontario board they'd be very happy to get the details of that but but yeah my um you know from my awareness there's a very small amount that that caused here and um you know i believe some of that may have already been 
essentially paid back or well be paid back. So, so, so anyways, yes, that is, you know, this is probably a concern that people have is that, but, but it, you know, it's really small compared to just the fact that it's been really dry. But, but anyways, yeah, Ontario board members and staff are always having the answer to those kinds of questions. All right. Um, is it fair to say that the period of, uh, and I, I don't know who to address this to, John and to some degree, Jeff, uh, this last question. Is it fair to say that the period of extraordinarily high water levels is over, uh, even though levels are still above level, appears they're all heading downwards? And uh, uh, basically, can you tell us that uh, the worst is behind us for the moment? <laughs> I'll talk water levels, <laughs> I guess. Uh, you know, certainly for this year, yes, it seems very unlikely that we could see any conditions that could, you know, potentially drive us back up to those record highs. So we. Should, for this year, yep, the worst would be behind us uh, across each of the lakes. Um, looking forward beyond that, it's still <laughs> still anybody's guess. We, you know, the, the signals are that we're going to see, you know, these kind of extreme fluctuations. You know, with has increasing wet conditions over time. You know, certainly I would say the worst is not uh, over for good. Um, you know, things can change very quickly here, but at least stay over the next six months. The worst is behind us. <laughs> You really shouldn't be seeing anywhere near the record highs that we saw last year. Any other yeah. comments from me? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just to John, I, I agree completely with John, and I think I think we would probably be well. We we need to keep in mind that we are this uh, trend towards increasing precipitation in our in our region and actually be outside of our region as well is is real, and it's uh, we we've got a, we've seen a little bit of a break in that, but. Uh, statistically, you, you look at where things have been, and and I I think we're we just going to have we'll have to wait and see. But certainly, there's a suggestion based on the on the recent past that the precip will go back up again. So you, you something we'll, we'll just have to be aware of and 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 be be prepared. Uh, but I, you know, we may not have seen the last of it at least for the long term. I I think. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you very much all speakers and uh, this was another um <clears throat> another good session so i appreciate all the people also on the line who hung in there the whole time and uh, uh i'm not going to say when we're going to be doing this again but we're going to at least try to do it periodically when there is a, a more or less a need to do it or at least once a year something along those lines so thank you all very much i'm going to stop the recording